we're going to carry on on a theme of uh, serving God in a way that pleases God. In the very first session, we spoke about how uh, God can use anyone to serve him. Everybody in the world is in God's hands. There are people who are serving God without knowing God, without knowing they're serving God. There are those who know God and serve him, but not the, the wrong motivation. But God wants to serve him in a way that pleases him. Uh, Romans chapter 14, 17, 18 says, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. For whoever serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and approved by people. So you're looking at different ways of serving God in the way that pleases God. It's the seventh session on that. It began on serving God uh, faithfully, then serving God wholeheartedly, then serving God with a clear conscience, then serving God sincerely, then serving God diligently, and then serving God lovingly. Six sessions we finished. Today, the seventh session, and today's uh, session is on serving God with zeal, with enthusiasm. Now, the word enthusiasm in English language came from two Latin words, en and theos. En means in, theos means God. So all those people who are in God, there's something very unique about them, enthusiasm. So it actually came from People who knew God were serving God. So this enthusiasm or zeal is incidental to a walk with God. When you know God, you will serve him with zeal. And we serve him because we love him. We spoke about serving God lovingly in the last session. So today we're going to talk about how never to lose the zeal for God. In Romans chapter 12, verse 11, Paul writes, Never be lacking in zeal, Keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. The next verse says, Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. When we uh, face, when you serve God, we face difficulties, suffering. And when suffering comes, some people tend to lose their zeal for God. And Paul exhausts his people, never be lacking in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor. Fervor means basically enthusiasm and be aglow in spirit. Be on fire for the Lord. And when you have suffering, be joyful in hope, patient in suffering, faithful in prayer. Now, there are people who uh, have zeal for God without even knowing God. Yes. The Apostle Paul was like that. He was very zealous in his own faith, he believed that all these Christians are misguided people and they are believing erroneously that Jesus is the Christ. He was persecuting the church. And that persecuting church was actually an expression of his zeal. He spoke about his past life with the Philippian church, how before he became a believer, how in terms of the Jewish perspective of a typical Jew, he had all the credentials all the qualifications of a very ardent, zealous Jew. Philippians chapter 3 from verse 5. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, regard the law of Pharisee, the regard to zeal persecuting the church, the regard to religious righteousness faultless. All the credentials and all the qualifications of a typical popular Jew. With regard to zeal, persecuting the church. So his zeal for whatever he believed at that time manifested in persecuting the church. And God saw the heart of Paul that this man is faithful to whatever he believed, even though it was wrong. He's faithful to that. So he chose him, revealed himself to Paul, chose him, to be an apostle. And look at the way Paul writes about that to Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his service. Now, the apostle Paul, after becoming an apostle, after becoming a believer in Christ, servant of God, he has a burden for the Jews. 
In Romans chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, he writes, Romans chapter 10, verse 1 and 2, that his heart's desire and prayer to God is that Israel will be saved. My heart's desire, my prayer to God, is Israel will be saved. For they have zeal for God, but zeal is not based on knowledge. He had a burden for them. They had so much of zeal in doing what they thought was right. They didn't know that Jesus is a Messiah. They were trying to be very faithful to the law. And uh, he says they have zeal for God. It's not based on knowledge. Knowledge of the Old Testament, yes. Not knowledge of God. Paul had a lot of knowledge about the Old Testament. When he was, he was taught by Gamaliel. City taught by Gamaliel. Very accurately taught the Old Testament scriptures but no revelation of God. When he did not know God, he had zeal for God. Israelites don't know God personally, have zeal for God. How much more when we come to know Jesus, we should have zeal and enthusiasm for serving him. And look at the Apostle Paul after he became a believer. What amazing zeal he has. He went through so many experiences in his ministry, so much of suffering and persecution. Yet he persisted because when he, had no, when he had no knowledge of God, he had zeal. How much more he knew God personally, so much of zeal. When he go to Jerusalem, he told the people, uh, the leaders in the church in Ephesus, when he took leave of them at Miletus, when everyone warned him later on also in Caesarea not to go to Jerusalem, they arrested and persecuted. In the book of Acts, chapter 20, verse 24, he says, how a concern of my life worth nothing to me. If you may finish the race and come to the task Lord has given me, the task of testifying the gospel of God's grace. Nothing else matters for me. Not even my own life. I will have to complete the task he has given me with enthusiasm, with zeal. He persisted with single-minded focus. And he had again a burden. Just like he had a burden for the Jews to be saved. He had a burden for Christians not to get distracted from this single-minded service of God. The church in Corinth they wrote, in 2 Corinthians 11, chapter 3, I'm afraid that just like you were deceived by the serpent's cunning, your mind will be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. In the case of the Apostle Paul, no deviation, no distraction, single-minded focus and full of zeal. Went through so many experiences, but he persisted because that zeal came from his personal knowledge of God. Now, he writes about his conversion. He made out the conversion what happened to the Galatian churches. In Galatians chapter 1, from verse 15, he writes, God who set me apart from birth, when God who set me apart from birth and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me, the message among Gentiles, I didn't consult any man. That is about that in Galatians chapter 1 from verse 15. After God revealed himself to him, Paul didn't consult any man. He went straight to, from Damascus, he went to Saudi Arabia. Arabia he went. And there he spent time with the Lord, taught by God. And then, after some time, he goes back to Damascus. After three years, he goes to Jerusalem, where he meets the apostles. Peter, for 15, 15 days, he stayed with Peter, met the other apostles, uh, James, the Lord's brother. After he became a believer, he goes straight to Arabia of all places. And there he was taught by Jesus, because his ministry was a direct revelation from the Lord. He's teaching also. In Galatians 1.11, he writes, the gospel is not something man made up, I didn't see many men received by revelation from Christ. So after he became a believer, he depended totally on the Lord, didn't go to see the apostles. He goes to Arabia, and there spends time with Jesus, and throughout his life he spent time with the Lord. Then only after three years he goes to Jerusalem, meets the apostles, and later on goes from the Holy Spirit, again goes to, the, to uh, Jerusalem. His dependence totally upon the Lord, rooted and built up in the Lord. The root and built up on the Lord, you'll never lose zeal for God. When we serve Him, 
will face difficulties. Some people who are not rooted in Christ will fall away. They are not rooted in Christ when difficulties come. Jesus spoke about the seed that fell the ground. Birds came and took it away. Some fell on rocky places. Parallel of the sore of the seed. 13th chapter of Matthew. Some seed fell along the path. Birds came up. There's a devil taking about a stone in the heart. Some seed fell on rocky ground. The soil was shallow. It sprung up quickly because soil was shallow. And the sun came in with her. What's the meaning of sun coming up? 13th chapter of Matthew, verse 21, Jesus explains that. It refers to people who receive the word of God with great joy, but no root, shallow, superficial faith. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word of God, they fail away. When you obey the word of God, we face difficulties. And these people, when trouble or persecution came because of their faith, they were not rooted in Christ, they fell away. They lost the zeal. Whereas Paul exhausts the church in Colossae, in Colossians chapter 2, number 6 and 7, just yes, receive Jesus Christ, Lord, continue to live in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthen the faith as you are taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. First, you never lose zeal for the Lord, which should be rooted and built up in him. Faith in him, not in a fellowship, not in a church, not in a Zoom meeting, not in a fellowship of your friends and comfort zone, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because only he will never let you, you never know, fail you nor forsake. People will let you down. People like that. They'll fail you, they'll forsake you. Lord will never fail us, not forsake us. Christ was forsaken by the Father because he had all the sins of the world upon him. Took his eyes away from, the, from Jesus. That's why he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was forsaken that we will not be forsaken. We will never be forsaken. What an amazing grace it is. So we rooted in Christ, we will not fall away. We will always have the zeal for God. Now, letter of Hebrews written to Jewish Christians who when they turn to Jesus initially, they are full of joy. They were excited about the, uh, the faith in Jesus. But then after some time, that zeal went away, reduced. In fact, Paul writes to them in the fifth chapter of Hebrews, verse 12 and 13, he writes about In your little milk, peace and infant, is not a good reading righteousness. Verse 13. Solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Verse 12, he writes, even though by this time you ought to be teachers, by this time you will be teachers of God's word, but you need to eliminate teachers all over again. You are living on milk, not solid food. Solid food is for the mature. How do you become mature in Christ? You become mature when you consider pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Maturity takes time. You have to go through the process of facing difficulties. By now you should be mature, but you need remedy teachings. James chapter 1, 2, 3, 4 is written. Consider pure joy in the face trials of many kinds. For testing your faith, there is perseverance. Perseverance finishes work in you, that you be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Maturity happens over a period of time. In that time, we go through trials. When trials come, consider pure joy. Don't lose the zeal. Be joyful in hope. That hope is Jesus. Hope is a person. You know that? He's a person. It's a person. How do you know that? First Timothy chapter 1 verse 1. Jesus Christ, our hope. He is our hope. He'll never change. He's always there's hope in him. Be joyful in him. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. When difficulties come, you should never lose that enthusiasm and zeal for God. So these uh, recipients of this letter of Hebrews, when they first turned to Jesus, they were all full of zeal. 
and the Paul, uh, the writer of the letter writes to them and says, in uh, chapter 10, number 32, 36, he writes, remember those day days when you received the light and stood your ground in the face of trials, in the face of suffering. At times, a public exposed to insult and persecution. Other times, you stood side by side with those who are so treated. You are simple as those in prison and joyfully accept, uh, joyful accept the conflicts and properties because you know you have better and lasting possessions. Don't throw away a conference, be richly rewarded. You need to persevere. When you stood the test, you reach the crown of life. When you stood the test, you need to persevere. When you run, run the will of God, you will receive what has been promised. When they first turned to Jesus, they were full of enthusiasm. Remember those days. Remember those days. You stood your ground. In the face of persecution, took a stand, he exposed insult and suffering, but he stood their ground. What happened to all the zeal you had then? And then the writer reminds them as to who they have come to believe. For the Jews, some of the things very, very dear to them are, for example, Moses, the prophets, the priesthood, are very, very dear to the angels. Very dear to them. And the first three chapters of Hebrews, writer talks about how the Lord Jesus Christ is superior to all of them. He's superior to all the prophets, superior to all the angels, superior to Moses, is the ultimate priest. He reminded them who they have come to believe in him. The Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. For them to understand who they come to believe in, that they won't lose the zeal for God. For the Jews, all these entities, all the institutions, like Moses, priesthood, prophets, and angels were all very, very dear to them. And he's writing to them and saying, Christ far above all these institutions, which you so much, put you so much of trust in, to remind them who they have come to believe in. And the Apostle Paul put to Timothy, about how he come, who he's come to believe in. When Timothy went to suffering, so did Paul. He wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. Don't be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me as prisoner, but join me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. Don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be ashamed of the Lord. He's ashamed of the Lord, ashamed of Paul the prisoner. And then 11th and 12th verse of the same chapter, he writes, of this gospel, I was made a herald, an apostle, and a teacher. That's why I'm suffering as I am. Yet I know whom I have believed. And I'm convinced he's able to guard what I understood to him for that day. In other words, he's in a way, sarcastic telling Timothy, do you know who you believed in? Do you know who it is, it is you believed in? I know whom I have believed. And this person I believed in is able to guard what I'm interested in to him for that day. I'm interested in treasures in heaven and he's keeping it safe for me. So why are you feeling ashamed of Jesus? Ashamed of me, the prisoner. Same with the Hebrew, Hebraic uh, believers, Jewish believers who come to believe in Christ, in the book of Hebrews, the Sapiens, they had to be reminded who they come to believe in. Now let's go to the 12th chapter of Hebrews. Any fantastic passage this is. So he's reminding them who they come to believe him or where they have come. 12th chapter of Hebrews, verse 18 to 21, talks about where they have not come. Where they have not come. A geographical place where they have not come. He writes to them and says, You haven't come to the mountain that can be touched, it is burning with fire, to darkness, gloom, and storm, to a trumpet blast, and the voice speaking such words that those who heard it. Beg that no further word be spoken. They couldn't bear what they commanded. If an animal touches the mountain, it might be stoned. The sight was so terrifying that Moses was trembling with fear. What is that mountain? The mountain is Mount Sinai. When they came to Mount Sinai in the Old Testament time, as they approached the mountain, actually Moses came there to worship God, and God sent him back with a message. Asked Israel, they obey him or not? They said they'll obey him. 
Then God tells most of the Israelites, two days consecrated as well, third day come near the mountain. The third day slowly approach the mountain. This is found in the book of Exodus, 19th chapter of the 18 says, God came upon the mountain in fire, in fire, burning with fire, as recorded in the book of Hebrews. The thunder, lightning, a trumpet blast, a spectacular display of God's presence. And the Israelites got scared of God. They didn't want to come near. They tell Moses, Moses, you speak to us and we will listen. Don't have God speak to us. For if God speaks to us, we will die. Book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 19. Moses, you speak to us, we will listen. Don't have God speak to us. If God speaks to us, we will die. Such was the manifestation of God's presence upon the mountain, Mount Sinai, which actually in Arabia, not in Egypt. They're scared, couldn't come near. Lightning, thunder, whole mountain fire, smoke, drought, tempered blast. They stayed at a distance. They couldn't come near. And then Moses tells them, 20th chapter verse 20, don't be afraid. God has come to test you. So the fear of God will be in you to keep from sinning. Don't be afraid. Next day he says, but be afraid. Don't be afraid, but have fear. Very contradictory statement, isn't it? What he means is, don't be so afraid of God, it's scared to come near God, but have a reverent fear of God that you obey Him. Although Moses told them, don't be afraid, he was trembling with fear. That was the example of the manifestation of God's presence upon that Mount Sinai in the Old Testament. They were scared, couldn't come near the mountain. What does the mean, Paul, at the writer of the book of Hebrews, right? We haven't come to such a mountain. They can test the burning with fire, darkness, gloom, and storm, the trumpet blast. Uh, they heard a voice saying, don't come near the mountain. You know, comes in with, with stone, with dead, with dead. That was terrifying. The animal to the mountain, it must be stone. They couldn't come near. And then, after saying, don't, you don't come such a mountain, no testament. Verse 22, 24 writes, but you have come to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, city of the living God. You have thousands and thousands of angels in joyful assembly. You come to God, judge of all men. First, righteous men made perfect. The sprinkled blood speaks a better word than the blood of David. You come to Mount Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem, city of the living God, to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. As they joyfully worship God, you can worship God. You don't come to Mount Sinai, you come to Mount Zion. Zion means the cross. You know, but I have a 17 is written. For a Mount Zion to be deliverance, it will be holy. The house of Jacob will possess inheritance, the house of Jacob will be fire. No testament time, they could not come near the Mount of Sinai because of God's presence upon that mountain in fire. They are scared of the fire of God upon the mountain, physical fire on that mountain, thunder, trumpet blast, lightning, sound. They couldn't come near. In the here of New Testament, it says, you are not come such a mountain. They are come to Mount Zion. Because you come to Mount Zion, don't have to scare the fire of God because you are the fire of God. How is it that will be? It will be fire. Today, we are the fire of God. God's word in us is fire. Praise God for that. Remember the time when Jeremiah complained to God about, first of all, persecutors, then about accusers, then about wicked people. Persecutors, 15th chapter of Jeremiah, verse 16. Accusers, Jeremiah 12, sorry, Jeremiah 18 chapter. He complains about uh, accusers. Complains about wicked people flourishing. Jeremiah 12 chapter, first few verses. Finally, complains to God about God himself. Jeremiah 28 chapter, verse 7. Lord, you deceive me and I got deceived. You overwhelm me and prevail. Everyone mocks me. I'm overwhelmed. You overwhelm me and prevail. Everyone mocks me. Whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaim, proclaim violence and destruction. The word of God has brought me inside reproach all day long. 
But if I said, I will not mention him or speak any more on his name. His word in my heart is like a fire. A fire shut up in my bones. I can't hold it. In. I cannot hold it. But God's word in him was fire. Because it came from the Holy Spirit. When we allow God's spirit to speak to our hearts, filled with the word of God, we'll be on fire for God. In fact, that's why the Lord told Jeremiah, after Jeremiah complained to God, and said, your word, my like a fire, I can't hold it. I have to speak out. Praise God, he spoke out. But then when there was confusion in, in Jerusalem, as Jeremiah prophesied that in Jerusalem, they'll be they've taken away in Jerusalem, go to uh, Babylon, they'll be exiled there for 70 years. Some other prophets said two years of exile. God told Jeremiah 70 years. Where 70 years, where is two years? People preferred two years or 70 years and they criticized Jeremiah. Some other people thought, I had a dream, I had a dream, all false prophecies. Jeremiah was actually quite perplexed. Why these people are saying wrong things? The Lord tells Jeremiah, read the chapter Jeremiah, let him have a dream tell his dream, let him has my words speak it faithfully. Verse 28 to 9. What a straw do grain. Is not my word like a fire, like a hammer that breaks a rock into pieces? Let him have a dream, tell him his dream. Tell his dream. Let him have the word speak it faithfully. What a straw do grain. He's telling you, speak my word. Let him have the word speak it faithfully. Is not my word like a fire? Like how much it breaks a rock into pieces. You say, is it not like a fire? You already know it. You complained to me about I'm old and what being prevailed you. And you know it. So speak out the word. Praise God, Jeremiah never flinched from speaking God's word. He had zeal for God in spite of difficulties. 40 years of ministry, not one person listened to what he said. When he's called for ministry, Lord told him, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 1. Go up and down the streets of Jerusalem. Look around and consider. Search out the squares. This is one person. Please honestly and seek the truth. I will forgive this city. After 40 years of ministry, not one person listened to him. Yet he kept on speaking. Yes, he complained. Complained about wicked people, persecutors, accusers, compared to God about God also. But he never stopped speaking. And then later on, he's the one who says to God, great is your faithfulness of God. The book of Lamentations was written by Jeremiah. After they invaded uh, by, by the Babylonians, he's taken, he's well treated by the Babylonians. And then the third chapter of Lamentations, three, he writes, his mercy never failed, great is your faithfulness of God. Who's con confirming God's faithfulness? Jeremiah. He saw the faithfulness of God, how God used even the Babylonians to give favor to Jeremiah. So great is the faithfulness of God. Such a faithful God. And therefore, as he persists in serving him with all difficulties, we'll have a lot of difficulties in life. Who doesn't have difficulties? Acts 14, 22 says, through many hardships we enter the kingdom of God. So never lose the zeal because every small thing we do, God takes note. So how do you preserve this zeal? You preserve the zeal by having intimate fellowship with God. Never withdraw from having a personal time with God. Be rooted and built up in Him. Like I said, not in a fellowship, not in a church. They're all very important. But they're secondary to fellowship with God. When you fellowship with God, in the midst of difficulty, He will encourage you. He is a God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles. Every trouble we go through, he comforts us. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 4, Jesus said, part of the Beatitudes, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. There are many experiences we go through in life which cause us to maybe mourn or feel sorrow, feel sorry for ourselves. But he said, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The word blessed here, is from a Greek word called makarios. Makarios means happy. Happy are those who mourn. Does it seem contradictory? Mourning and happiness both go together. Happy are those who mourn. 
We say, those who mourn, or they shall be comforted. Meaning, when you go through a circumstance that otherwise people mourn, in that circumstance, God will encourage you. He's a God of all comfort. It's the nature of God. Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 onwards. Nature of God. God of all comfort comforts us in all our troubles. So, because the comfort is in the trouble, we are happy. Blessed, happy are those who mourn. So, in that mourning period, they are comforted by the Lord. The comfort supersedes the mourning. We find our joy in the Lord. Now, we know what the Bible says. First Thessalonians chapter 5, 16, 17, 18. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. In the midst of difficulties, give thanks. One question many people ask me is, in everything I give thanks, but should I give thanks for everything? For everything, should I give thanks? Yes, we should. Why? I will say that. Ephesians 5.20 For everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. For everything, give thanks. But in everything, God works together for the good of those who love God and may God accord His purpose. So it's possible for us never to lose that zeal for God, excitement for God, enthusiasm for God. The word for uh, zeal in Greek is a word called zelon, which basically means diligence and zeal, enthusiasm, excited about serving God and not laying back, going slow in the ministry. When you have zeal, you look forward to serving God more and more. Never look back. Always going ahead. Once you put a hand to the plow, you should not look back. Because serving God is a great privilege. Greatest work anybody can do is to serve God. So, how does how that zeal come? Basically, it comes from our intimacy with God. When Saul was perceived in Christians, he was had zeal. Was in Christians. No revelation of God. Knew the Old Testament very well, taught by Gamaliel, theoretical knowledge. First Corinthians 8 1 says, Knowledge puffs up, love builds up. He had knowledge, academic, theoretical knowledge. A lot of people have knowledge of the Bible. A lot of people have knowledge of the Bible. They know all the Bible verses very well. Many pastors are very, very knowledgeable, theoretically study the Bible much more than many of us. But theoretical knowledge, academic knowledge, that puffs up. Whereas love builds up. When you, when you seek to know God through the Bible, not know the Bible, know God through the Bible, then you have love. When you have love for God, you will serve Him with zeal. Because service comes out of love. Last, week, last session we spoke on that, serving God lovingly on Tuesday. Go back and listen to the recording. Serving God with love. You serve God with love, automatically zeal for. That's why I put this topic today after love. See, serving God with love, serving God with zeal. You look forward to serving God. Where next, Lord? What should I do, Lord? Remember a time when Saul had a revelation of Jesus? And then first question he put to must, who are you, Lord? And Jesus is not whom we're persecuting. Second question, what should I do, Lord? What should I do? Meaning, what do you want me to do? I will do. And he never looked back on serving God. He spoke about various experiences, went through ministry, various experiences. Second Corinthians 6, chapter 8 to 10. All the experience of ministry when he went through so many different experiences. Second Corinthians 6, chapter 8 to 10. Through glory and dishonor, glory and dishonor, bad report and good report. Genuine, it regards imposters. Known, it regards unknown. Dying, it will live on. Beaten, yet not killed. Sorrowful, it always rejoicing. Poor, yet making many rich. Having nothing, yet possessing everything. What a contrast. Because of that, he could persist in the ministry. End of his life, he writes to Timothy. 2 Timothy, chapter 4, 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I kept the faith. 
Now the store for ministry, that's store for me, crown of righteousness. With the Lord, the righteous judge will grant to me on that day. That fight of good fight also includes, is part, it, 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 it covers, the devil trying to reduce our seed. So what's the point in serving your God? Look what he's doing in your life. You have so difficulties with God. Every other day you have difficulties. What's the point? When you do not serve God, everything was fine with you. Now look at the way how you are suffering. You tend to lose zeal. That's a fight. So no. Everything I do, God takes note of. I'm serving him because I love him. He loves me with an everlasting love. Unconditional love. Everlasting love. So I serve God. Out of love, unconditionally, until I die, I keep serving God. So much so, Romans 14, 8, Paul writes, For me to live as Christ, to die is gain. Uh, sorry, Philippians 1, 21. That is. Romans 14, 8, he says, If you live, you live to the Lord. If you die, you die to the Lord. Whether you live or die, we belong to the Lord. So once you put a hand to the floor, don't look back. The different kinds of service. Please don't think only preaching and teaching is service. Some people think, and you have visible ministry, full-time ministry, not a servant of God. We all are servants of God, whatever God has called us to do. In this world, we are here to live for Him. We don't belong to ourselves. We are His. We belong to Him, purchased by His blood. He has a call for every one of us. So ask Him, reveal to you what your calling is. As you're busy doing the general will of God, fellowship with Him, reading the scriptures, praying, enjoying His fellowship, enjoying fellowship with God's people, as you're busy doing the general will of God, He will reveal to you His specific will. Once you know that, don't look back. What we ask you to do, you do. We all know about David, a man after God's own heart. And uh, the Lord testifies about David. And Paul, talking about that, writes to tell the church in, I think, Iconium, uh, Peace in Antioch, Acts 13, chapter 22. Acts 13, 22. How God testifies about David. I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I tell him to do. The expression or manifestation of a man after God's own heart is he will do everything that God wants him to do. Okay? Look at David's life. First thing we think about is, oh, David, he committed adultery. The arranged murder of Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. Yes, he did that. But look at his life after he repented. Look at his life after he repented. After he repented, an exemplary life. So much so, God testifies about David. First Kings 15, chapter verse 5. For David done what's right in the eyes of God. I did not fail to keep any of God's commandments all the days of his life, except in the case of Uriah the Hittite. The one area, the terrible things, arranged Uriah's murder. After that, exemplary life. And therefore, whatever be your past, we all make mistakes. We turn from it, repent of it. Repent is not just saying sorry, stopping doing what you're doing, wrong things, and pursue after God. He will never fail us, never forsake us. He will never reject us. Like a baby trying to walk and falls down, God will pick us up. And never lose the zeal. The devil wants to reduce our zeal. He will try to remind us about, oh, look at the user, what you are serving God, what are the troubles you are facing. Other people are enjoying life, look at you. One mistake, you make you get punished for it. Because we are so special to God, God rebukes us for our mistakes. Amos chapter 3, verse 2, God says to the Israelites living in northern kingdom of Israel, you only have chosen among all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for your sins. He rebooks us, that says, for our good, that we share in his holiness. What an awesome God we serve. And serving God is a joy, a privilege. Never lose the zeal. Let the zeal increase. It will increase when you have intimate fellowship with God. Good times, bad times, successes, failures, always go to Him. Begin the day with the Lord, the whole day have fellowship with God, have times of prayer, idealaptos, bouts of prayer, whole day, 
First thing in the morning, spend time with God, ask in the agenda for the day. Go about fulfilling it. You will face difficulties, opposition, criticism, gossip, slander, discouragement. God never discourages. Always an encourager. So my child, every small thing you do, I'm taking you. Don't lose that seed. Keep a spiritual fervor, a glow in spirit. You are a fire of God. In the Old Testament time, they went to Mount Sinai. They couldn't come near. They scared the fire of God. Today, we don't get scared of the fire of God because we are the fire of God. Hebrews 1 7, He makes the servants flames of fire because the word in the house is fire. Paul wrote the Thessalonian church, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 1920. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Don't it process the contempt. Test everything, hold on to what is good. Prophecy means hearing from God and speaking out. When you listen to a prophecy, genuine prophecy, who's speaking to you, the person speaking to you, the prophet, listen to God and speaking to you. Receive it. Test it. If it's from God, if it's from God, accept it. If you reject it, then you are putting out the Spirit's fire. Because the word coming through prophecy is the fire of the Spirit. The more the word goes into our hearts and minds, the more it will be fire. The other time the disciples are saying, as Jesus spoke to them, what do they say? May not our hearts burning when he spoke? May not our hearts burning when he spoke? As he spoke, that word came into the heart and was actually physically burning the heart. Because the word of God refreshes, encourages, divides soul and spirit, always blesses us. So listen to prophecy and listen to God speaking to you directly. What a joy it is. And when you share the word of God also, it is fire. You know why? It's a double-edged sword. What about double-edged sword? This is people you minister to, this is you also. The more you share, the more you are blessed. Sometimes when I go and speak in meetings, people say, brother, thank you, brother, for giving, bringing the word to us. The word comes from God. And I get blessed when I share the word of God. It blesses me. Double-edged sword. As it blesses people, it blesses me. Because the source of that teaching is the Holy Spirit. When he speaks, he always builds us up. His words always build us up. Prophecy for exhortation, strengthening and comfort. And when that goes into the heart, the heart will be on fire. We will be the fire of God. He makes his servants flames of fire. Hebrews chapter 1, one verse 7. So don't even think of you know, losing the fire because it will not go. A glow in spirit. So we are the fire of God. Unlike what was in time, they came to the Mount of Sinai. They couldn't come near. Scare the fire of God. I won't come near. Most of you speak. God speaks, we will die. Whereas we come to Jesus. His word lives in us. Word in the heart is like a fire. Praise God. Let's pray. Please close your eyes. Let me pray for all of us. And Father, thank you, Lord, for your love and grace and mercy, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You make us flames of fire, Lord. Full of enthusiasm and zeal for you, Lord. Let the zeal never go away, Lord. And I pray each one of us, Lord, will take time to be with you, to have fellowship with you, Lord, each and every day. To enjoy you, Lord. And even if you sin, Lord, we'll repent, Lord, and turn from it and move on in life, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, even though we are dust. Remember, we are dust. In that dust, you put a treasure, Lord, the knowledge of Christ. Help us live by that treasure, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. Give you glory. I pray for each one of us, Lord, even now, we all be anointed by our Holy Spirit's power and fire. To live for you each and every day, Lord. To be a blessing to others is your blessing. I want to give you all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.